Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. As I mentioned last week, I uh, I flew out to Grand Rapids, Michigan to visit one of my, my client companies. Um, they made like 100 million doses of the J&J COVID vaccine, and they're going to make the, the monkeypox vaccine for Bavaria Nordic soon. And uh, they just wanted to show me and a, a bunch of clients and consultants what they're building and, and sort of what they've learned from the experience throughout the pandemic and, and you know, how you manage growth in the well, contract manufacturing for biopharmaceuticals space. And uh, I haven't had a facility tour since February of 2020 on the last trip I did before the, the pandemic really hit when I was in Japan. And it was actually kind of a, it was a neat process. I mean, I know it'll sound incredibly boring. Um, and I know I'm not connected closely enough to, to manufacturing and operations to, to really understand everything. Like, I get what they're talking about, but I don't get the real implications the way guys who actually make stuff do. Um, but I'll just say more than 20 years around that stuff, I've picked up enough to seem smarter than the average bear. Uh, also, there was a point at which there was a uh, one of the guys conducting one part of the tour. I felt like I'd kind of... Um, I don't want to say ignored, but just like weirdly slighted the night before at the, the reception. So I made sure to ask him a, a particular question in his space uh, when we finished his, his part of the, the tour. And he was really gratified to be able to talk about serialization options and what they're doing and, and all this stuff. So um, anyway, the upshot was, you know, I, I got to see some of the people at the company from, well, I've known them for almost the entire 20 year span in the 20 plus year span in the industry uh, from different companies they've worked at. And and it was just great to, to hang out and catch up with these guys during dinner, seeing how we've all changed from like 2000, 2001, et cetera. I mean, it actually occurred to me on the flight out there that the only other time I've been to Michigan was to Kalamazoo when Pharmacia brought me out there. Uh, the thing was, Pharmacia got bought by Pfizer in 2003, which made me realize this all had to have been more than 20 years ago that I, I visited that site, which ended up making all the, the Pfizer COVID vaccine, by the way. Um, that said, nothing in my professional life should be more than 20 years ago, right? But anyway, it was a good trip. Uh, the thing was, I didn't sleep well in the hotel, and that's part of getting back to the, the pre-pandemic world where I had all this business travel, etc., and by the time I got home early Thursday morning, 6 a.m. flight back, um, well, before the trip, I thought, you know, I could maybe go down to, the, to Maryland for the small press expo and see all my comics pals and maybe get in a couple of podcasts and just just get back to that world again. Um, midway through the trip, I realized, Gil, that's completely insane. And when I landed Thursday, I thought, oh, thank God I'm not going down to Maryland. Uh, I was zonked. There was a ton of for me to do this week. I'm still in the middle of the run sprint to, to my own conference in, in mid-October. Um, but on top of that, I have two conferences Wednesday and Thursday in, in Philly and New Jersey. And and just making a three-hour plus trek down to Bethesda on Friday and back on Sunday would have left me completely non-functional. Which is to say, I missed seeing my comics pals and, and past guests and people I know I would have had a good time just catching up with but that's okay. Um, there's only so much you can do, and the work still has to take precedence over everything else. There's just no way on earth I could have done all that and, and um, remained remotely functional. But, you know, maybe there'll be another show down the line. In fact, uh, right before my own conference, the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus show is happening at Saturday and Sunday, and I'm up in the air about whether I will be ready enough with everything for my own show to go away for two days before that. But anyway, we'll, we'll find out that answer in a uh, I guess about three weeks. 
Meanwhile, I got to prep for tomorrow's conference because I'm moderating a panel in an area I don't have much expertise in and giving a half hour presentation immediately after. And that's going to be my first real in-person speaking gig with an audience since February 2020. And um, I'll be honest, I got anxiety that's sort of teetering on the border of resentment. And I have to correct that and make sure that doesn't come out in relation to the audience as opposed to my self-hatred. And that means bringing, you know, Mr. Wonderful to the fore when I, I get on stage. It'll be some work, but it's it's what I used to do in the past. And I just have to get back into that that mindset. I'm telling you all this and hopes that no one's listening. Um, anyway, let's get to this week's show. And um, maybe we'll we'll touch on what it means to, to have a couple of different personae over the course of the, the conversation you're about to hear. Now, my guest this time is Richard Butner, who has a fantastic new short story collection, fantastic in more ways than one, uh, called The Adventurists from Small Beer Press. Uh, Richard's publisher, Gavin Grant, emailed me about it a, a few, a couple of months ago. And I think it's because he's known me, at least in passing, on and off for, again, more than 20 years. Um, and he had an idea of what would be right up my alley. And holy crap, he was right. The Adventurists is an absolute marvel of a, a collection. Um, a lot of the stories, they, they, they hew close to the real, but, but teeter on the edge of the fantastic. And, and sometimes they go right over that, that precipice. Um, and a lot of the characters are near my age or, or a little younger. And their stories involve something I'm, I'm really, fixated on myself, which is, is reframing or reclaiming the past, but seeing it as, as another world, I guess. It's, um, it's a really haunting set of stories that he's got there. And some of them are literally haunting in, in terms of ghosts, but, but it's a haunting set of stories, again, many of which involve that, that attempt at, at fixing something that was lost. There's also a um, office-like story or an office life story that's absolutely shattering, um, and it never has to push too far into the unreal, um, given the Kafkaesque absurdities of, of office life as we know it. It's um, well, there, I mean, there are common themes throughout some of the the stories, and we talk about that in the conversation. But but each one of these pieces is is a beautiful, strange, and familiar world. And by world, I, I should stress, Richard really evokes the environment in which his characters live. I mean, you can feel the spaces in which they, they move and breathe, whether it's that weird office or a, a Ren Faire or childhood basement or backyard or or the secret tunnel under your high school that you've you just discovered. Uh, our past guest, of multiple occasions, Christopher Brown, uh, is friends with Richard and, and wrote last year in his field notes email, Richard has a particular gift for using old buildings and forgotten objects as portals and keys, conjuring a rare species of nostalgia that tells the truth. And that's why Christopher Brown is a real writer and I'm, I'm some schlub at a microphone. Um, but anyway, on top of all that, Richard's prose is it's precise without being overwrought and it's clear that these are stories he's he's lived with and, and crafted for years. The Adventurous was an absolute joy to read, and I'm, I'm awfully glad that Gavin at Small Beer Press let me know about it. Here's Richard's bio from the book. There, there's a more extensive one at his site. Richard Butner's fiction has appeared in Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, been shortlisted for the Speculative Literature Foundation's Fountain Award, and nominated for the Shirley Jackson Award. He has written for and performed with the Little Green Pig Theatrical Concern, Aggregate Theater, Bear Theater, the Nickel Shakespeare Girls, and Urban Garden Performing Arts. His nonfiction, on topics ranging from computers to cocktails to architecture, has appeared in IBM Think Research, Wired, PC Magazine, The News and Observer, Teacher, The Independent Weekly, The North Carolina Review of Books, Triangle Alternative, and Southern Lifestyle. He lives in North Carolina, where he runs the annual Sycamore Hill Writers Conference. We'll talk about that, too. He and Harry Houdini have used the same trap door. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Richard Butner. Tell 
tell me about seeing the adventurists uh, adventurists collected, seeing your stories in a, a single place, and you know whether there uh, there was a significant you know re editing process in terms of, of bringing the stories together. Um, so a few of these stories have been previously published, but I'd say the bulk of them had not been published anymore. And so just to to go back a little bit, yeah. Um, I think either right at the start of the pandemic or maybe right before um, Kelly Link of Small Beer Press, and who also is just a great writer, um, runs Small Beer Press with uh, Gavin Grant, her husband, uh, got in touch and basically said, uh, send me everything. We should have done this a long time ago. Send me everything. So for some definition of everything, I... uh, got out stories. And yeah, even before I sent them, sent the bulk of them into, uh, Gavin and Kelly, I, you know, there were some, the ones that had not been previously published. I wanted to clean them up a little bit or revise them or get them to a state. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that some of them weren't previously published is I had never sent them out. Um, so, uh, I sent those in and basically there were, you know, there were more stories than for a single collection. So, um, we went through a process of deciding which stories should be in this collection and which of them make sense thematically to be together. Um, so having said all that, yeah, seeing them together, uh, well, a, it's just a great feeling to have a book out. Um, it's, it's interesting because yeah, the stories are, are from such a widely, uh, different, time periods. The earliest one is from 1994. Uh, the most recent ones, I suppose you could say they're from, you know, 2021 in, in the sense that I was working on them and revising them and making some changes um, right before the book came out. Uh, I was, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, the other thing that uh, I love, just yeah. looking at the book, and I'm sitting here staring at a copy that's sitting on my desk, is it's a beautiful book. I was just could not be more happy with the cover art. Um, we discussed concepts and this is what the cover artists they found came up with. And I'm just really, really pleased to have a, a book that I'm proud of the way it looks uh, on the shelves in bookstores. It, it, it's killing me because Gavin sent me a PDF back when I thought we were going to record earlier. So I kept putting, oh, I don't need to buy the book yet. I'll, I'll do the P-. Now it's just like, oh, God, I really want to have this book, you know, in print in my 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 library here. So I'll be making that order right after we finish up the, the session today. So. Thank you. <laughs> I actually had a in the pharmaceutical world that I live in. I put out a newsletter every week, uh, and at the very end of it, I include what I read. And um, one of my guys wrote me yesterday to say, uh, "Is that adventurist book any good? Because uh, you, you mentioned it about two or three weeks ago, and I, I was wondering." So you'll get some more sales that'll be completely outside of the podcast world, but you know, people seem to trust our taste with this stuff. So oh, great, well, go thank you so much. Cool. Uh, I was glad when I got to the end of the book and saw where some of the pieces have been published because there was that one really cyberpunk uh, art story in the middle of it. And when I saw that it was from 1996, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that that makes sense. That totally captures a vibe I had right around that era also. It really sort of encapsulates that post-80s, post-Gibson, Sterling, et cetera, um, and Rucker and, and the rest, which I guess is a uh, – uh, we may as well dive in question – Tell me about your literary influences and your your writing upbringing. Um, you know, as, as a kid, of course, I just I, I was the kid who sat in the public library and read everything that was on the shelf, and so obviously, with that, you get a lot of uh, fantastic fiction. If you if maybe not science fiction, but certainly um, all the sort of children's books that that we read, whether it's Lewis Carroll or. Uh, Mary Poppins even, heck. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, then later on, I was really enamored of uh, a lot of those books for uh, know-it-all kids, the, the, uh, <laughs> the Encyclopedia Brown series. You know, I have no idea that. what you're talking about, yeah. Richard. <laughs> the, uh, the Three Investigators, the, you know, the Alfred Hitchcock yeah. presents The Three Investigators. You know, those books for um, for kids who maybe they're, if they have a superpower, their superpower is, is being... Uh, a little uh, annoyingly too smart for their own good sometimes. Um, (laughs) And then, yeah, I obviously I fell into science fiction. I really don't know what the ground zero was. I read the Heinlein juveniles, but I also was reading the, you know, the tripods books and and, and things like that. And um, 
eventually uh, a, a good friend of mine, a person uh, who I still know to this day, uh, and who has always been way hipper than than I have been, handed me a copy of Fantasy and Science Fiction magazine and said, uh, this story reminded me of you, and it was a Harlan Ellison story. And hmm. um, frankly, I was uh, a Harlan Ellison fanboy when I was a kid. Yeah, um, I read a lot of other science fiction, but, but that was the person I uh, really paid attention to, uh, whether it was his own writing or uh, the anthologies that he edited or people he recommended. Um, Frankly, as an adult, I am not that big of a Harlan Ellison fan for both reasons that have to do with there, the there are reasons and, yeah. and his life. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I would be lying if I were not would not say to you that yeah, that was probably the number one uh, literary influence uh, when I was a teenager. Um, and then, but but as with so many things, you know that that domino uh, cascaded a lot of other really really interesting dominoes. Um, uh, I learned about the works of Jim Salas uh, because Jim Salas had a story in one of the Dangerous Visions anthologies, and that's a writer who I uh, have tried to follow through the years and has had a, just a really, really interesting career. I um, mean, it's put out just some, some really, really amazing work in all different sorts of genres. Um, and then, and I'm probably skipping something here, <laughs> but... Uh, um, the other thing that was definitely true is that I had a lot of different interests. I was interested in uh, science fiction and fiction in general, but you know, I was not uh, I, the um, the advanced placement classes I was taking were not the English and the history ones. They were the technical ones I took. You know, I, I have two engineering degrees, um, and that was what I was doing uh, for a lot of my scholastic life. So I didn't have the uh, literary background, maybe that a lot of my colleagues have. Um, but I was also interested in theater. I was interested in music. I had, a, you know, I had a lot of different interests and I kind of dipped my toe into each one of them. Um, but when I was in school in college, um, in an engineering program, I had like very few free electives, but I, a free elective came up and there was a professor who I'd read in this, you know, student paper on campus who was a science fiction writer. I'd never heard of, I'd never heard of him uh, until I read about him in the paper, but the article about him said that he'd won uh, a Nebula award. And, you know, obviously uh, from being a, an Ellison fanboy, I knew that winning Nebula awards was a pretty good thing. And so that person is John Kessel. And I, I took his, um, the, one of the first writing workshop classes he taught, I took his undergrad writing workshop. And then I took the very first graduate level writing workshop class that he taught, uh, at North Carolina state university. And, um, that I just couldn't think of a more, a person who's been more pivotal to my fiction career than John. We, uh, you know, he was my teacher and my mentor, but we quickly became friends, um, just, realizing uh what what we had in common and what we were interested in and yeah we've been friends since since the 80s and from there i've just met so many other people um thanks to john who've been who've been influences uh you know karen fowler karen joy fowler karen fowler uh obviously i i eventually met Kelly because of a workshop, which we can talk more about. Um, yeah, definitely. I met Lou Shiner, who's a great friend and a, and a great writer, uh, all kinds of people like that. Yeah. It's a, um, and I'm, I'm not a writer, I'm just a, a, a Lamprey, but the degree of, I don't want to say camaraderie, but that, that sort of willingness in, in the SF and F field to just to bring people along, to, to bring people in. It, it's it's always something I found heartening from all the the guys I've met over the years. That, that just the I don't want to say farm system sense, but that that degree of just you know you're you're the next generation. Come on in, you got to meet everybody. You know, um, it, it really is welcoming in a way that uh, I'll say certain other artistic fields tend not to be or seem not to be. Oh so, sure, well, and science fiction has the you know it has the. Uh, the history of just the, the convention, you know, the science fiction conventions, which have, of course originally were uh, focused entirely on writing. Now they're much more media and, you know, films, sure. and television, and things like that. But still, you know, uh, some of those, some of the, some of the conventions of those conventions, I guess I'll say, <laughs> some of them are, are pretty good and some, you know, some of them maybe not so much, but yeah, definitely the, you know, the, you're a fan, there's fans and pros, but 
there, and there's a divide, but it's a divide where like the fans, many of the fans will, are expected to become pros and yeah, they, they get helped along and, and, you know, introduced to people and, and shown the ropes. And um, yeah, I don't think that happens in, in uh, as much in mainstream literary fiction. Sure. Sure. I will say my um, <laughs> bringing those two themes together. The first time I met Ellen Datlow was at ReaderCon a couple of years. Well, in the before time. And when she met me, she said, did I meet you at a party at Harlan's? To which I just burst out laughing with no, no, there's little to no chance of that happening. But, you know, no, we, we haven't met before, but we we get to meet now. Um, so, yeah, it's it's one of those things where everybody gets to meet at some point um, yeah. and usually through cons and festivals like that. But. But tell me, you mentioned, you know, organizing the stories or, or you know, deciding on the stories with a, a theme in mind or a group of themes. Returns and reunions seem to be a big part of the adventurists, either returning to high school or returning to an old friend or one's hometown or home. I live in the same house where I grew up. I've been here longer than anyone else. So it's a very different vibe for me than than for what a lot of your characters are going through. But but can you talk a little about that as a recurring theme? Unless that's a theme I'm pointing out to you for the first time, and there's no way on earth that's that's the case, right? <laughs> no, but it's funny you use that word return because that's a word that, it, it, as simple as it is, and I think it's very, I think it's apt. Um, it's a word that I had not thought of until I was just doing that reading. I was doing a reading in Hoboken, and uh, an, another an old friend of mine, uh, Tim Folion, who's a great musician and now a psychologist, um, used that word. You know, all your stories are about returns, and I really haven't thought about it that way. You know, I sort of think about like the, yeah, there's ones that are about time and, and going back in time. And there's ones that are about returning to places, but I just, the capital R return. I think that's a great way to encapsulate it. I'm um, very Homeric. So yeah, I'm more <laughs> of an Iliad than an Odyssey guy, but the Odyssey <laughs> means enough to me that, yeah, yeah. The, the return. So. <laughs> um, you know, for me, I guess when I, um, what the first time I had that kind of feeling that is the kind of feeling I'm trying to capture is, is when I went off to college and, um, I, I would, st I started having dreams about, you know, high school. And I'm like, well, okay, wait, I'm in college. Why am I having dreams about high school? Well, on one hand, it's the material that your brain has to work with. But on the other hand, it just, this, this nagging feeling of unfinished business. And I think that's a, I think that's a feeling that a lot of people have of, it, it sure feels like this place that I've left, uh, there were some loose ends and I don't even know exactly what those are, but, but I just have that feeling, that feeling of unfinished business, that feeling of, of a, something that just wasn't tied off to my complete satisfaction. And so I really, yeah, I like exploring that feeling. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's very attractive to me. Did you move around a lot as a kid or were you, yeah. were you stable? No, I didn't. I, I've, I'm very stable. Um, I, you know, the, the house I grew up in is still there. My sister and I, uh, co-own it and our, uh, my nephew's the, is the caretaker, uh, while we still have it. Um, I did not go to university very far away. Um, but still, I don't know. There's that feeling when, I, I mean, I don't visit my hometown, that often and so when when i do there's just that weird sort of like it almost takes your breath away feeling of like the ghost towns and it's not just one of course it's this whole string of them the ghost towns that are either underlying or overlaying the actual current state of the town um i don't know it's just like a it's an it's a it's an image and it's a feeling that i can't get away from a lot of times yeah. See, it's very different for me. Uh, for me, it's when I go back to places that I left for, you know, when I go up to my old college town or, or something like that. But for me, I've just been watching the same trees grow for 50 years and uh, not, nothing yeah. changes in my town. Everything is uh, basically because of environmental laws. You can't really build much now. And uh, yeah, it's it's I, I have to go somewhere else for change. It's a uh, it, it's a strange thing. But so many of your stories touched on that in, in so many ways that I found fascinating, um, just in terms of the, not just what the geography is, but how we you know, change and, and, you know, what the years do to us, right. I suppose. Right. Yeah. So did you figure out what the unfinished business is or is the book, the unfinished business well, as you discovered? <laughs> I think that's just one of the, you know, I mean, I like mysteries too, and, and I don't necessarily put the solutions, uh, 
on the page. And, and I think that might just be, have to be one of those mysteries that I'll never solve exactly. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what life is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was there much, well, let's say editing or re-editing of some of the older pieces or even the process once you selected the, the, the more recent stuff? Did you really either with Kel, uh, Kelly and Gavin or just, you know, on your own really kind of refine, refine, refine before print? Um, well, like I said, you know, there was a, there was an interval of time between Kelly saying like, Hey, send, send us everything and me actually sending stuff. And, and yeah, I, some of the stories that, like I said, I had, I had written them. I, they had never really, um, I'd never gotten gone through the, the process where, where I, where yeah. I wanted to send them out and having that deadline and having it be, um, something that was, a little bit of a, a little bit of pressure in the system actually helped a lot for me to like look at those stories and go, okay, what is the what does this need or what does it not need, and let's let's figure that out uh, a little more quickly than I usually work and and <laughs> get them out. And then yeah, once once I sent them in, um, you know, working with Kelly and Gavin, working with your friends can often be uh, maybe not the best situation, but no, I had a great experience <laughs> working with Kelly and Gavin on on them. Um, all the aspects of the book from the text to the, to the cover and, and the process. And yeah, um, there were some, there were a few, uh, sort of substantial edits, not even really edits, but just sort of, Hey, think about this some more. Think about this part of this story some more. Uh, there were maybe a handful of those. And then there was, you know, obviously some line editing and copy editing, but, um, not overall, very, very light handed, you know, not, not a lot of changes once, uh, I sent sent the things in. So I guess that's a transition to, to Sycamore Hill to the the writers workshop and whether you know these were stories that were part of the the workshop experience for you. Tell me about Sycamore Hill and and the workshop, it, its history and your involvement with it. Sure, um, Sycamore Hill is a invitation only workshop for professional writers of science fiction and fantasy and, you know, weird stuff in general, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, it was started in 1985 by uh, John Kessel and Mark Van Name. And uh, I often say Gregory Frost was involved in the beginning of it, too, because I think it was actually Greg who said, hey, Mark, you could you could run a workshop at your house. Um, we could put on a show. Yeah, yeah exactly. But even, <laughs> even before that, I guess the, one of the impulses behind it or some of the impulses behind it, you know, science fiction has a long history of these sorts of workshops. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Damon Knight and Kate Wilhelm had the uh, the Milford workshop. And that's the, you know, the, the workshop model is called the Milford model, the, the actual way that you sit in a critique circle and, and to talk about the manuscript. But uh, and John had been to a couple of those um Milford workshops as a last minute replacement. You know, he was, a, he was young at the time and said, Oh, we've got an empty slot. Suddenly, why don't you come and go to this workshop? So he really enjoyed the, those Milfords that he went to. And so he came back and said like, Oh, well maybe I could do something similar. And, and that's the very short Genesis of, of Sycamore Hill. Um, those guys started it. I was just, you know, I was a local friend who had never published anything professionally. I was helping drive people, you know, to and from the airport. Um, and then uh, once I did uh, publish a few things professionally, uh, John and Mark said, "Hey, do you want to do you want to come to the workshop?" And I did. And then um, by that point, I think th they had uh, they, they weren't they weren't doing it every year at that point. They were they'd kind of gone down. They they took in a, taken a couple of years off, and they were going to do it every other year. And um, they said, "Hey, why don't you get involved? Why don't you become one of the planners of it with with us?" So, so for a while, for like a maybe, a, I guess one one instance of it, the it was me and John and Mark were all the planners, and then Mark went his way, and for a while it was uh, John and I were were running it. It was also moving. Uh, we would because the whole point of the workshop was if for a, a place that you know we could afford to run it without spending too much money a lot of retreat centers are fairly expensive and so it was it started out in mark's basement and then it was at the north carolina school for the blind and then it was at a dorm at nc state and then um thanks to greg frost and judith berman uh we ran it for a, a few times up in the pew manor house on the main line in uh 
near Bryn Mawr <laughs> in <laughs> wow. Pennsylvania, um, yeah. which was a, at that point was a graduate school dormitory for Bryn Mawr University. Um, and then finally, the place where we've been for almost the past uh, 20 years is a retreat center up in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, that John found, which is a, a, a great place called Wild Acres. Uh, they have a lot of uh, crafts and music up there and then and writers as well. Um, so given that it's oh go on. Yeah. Uh, no, well go ahead. I was just I was trying to like do the quick summary of Sycamore Hill history. You know, the other, eventually eventually John was like, you know what, I'm bowing out to. This is just gonna be your this is gonna be years and years only now. And so I guess maybe starting in like two thousand and seven, I think. It's just been me running it, um and trying to do it uh we've been doing it every year since I think two thousand and five, maybe. Um so yeah, every year it's it's some people who've been before and some, hopefully some new faces and um, everybody brings a story and we sit around a circle and critique them for a week. And uh, what, what, what I like to say is it's like for web, for people, whether you're a professional writer all the time or whether you're a person with a day job, you get to go to a place for a week where words and stories matter in a way that they don't all the time in the real world. And I think that's a really great, great place to get to go to. That sounds well. It sounds fantastic, and I remember reading uh, Kelly Link talking to you about it, and and being filled with envy that I don't actually write enough to to you know even tie myself into this world at all. Which does raise the question: since it's invitation only, do people sort of drop hints at you periodically? You know, the oh hey, sure would be great to have a, a writer's workshop myself. You know, is there any any lobbying like that on the side, or does everyone trust that they'll get an invite when it's it's the right time? Oh uh, well, no. I mean, I you know, the on the one hand, I keep the invitation process sort of behind the, the you know the Wizard of Oz's curtain a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, it's there are many things it's not. You know, it's not it's not a it's not some sort of contest or, or ranking system or sure. uh, sure. anything like that. I mean, there are people who obviously um, have been many, many times. Um, there's plenty of people who are great writers who have never been at all um, and maybe never even been invited. Um, it, you know, the thing I say about it is a lot of it's just pure math. There've been, you know, it's been going since 1985 there have been a little over a hundred unique individuals who've attended. And of those little over a hundred, I think we're maybe between 110 and 120 at this point of those about half have been only one time. Mm -hmm. So um, you think about the number of science fiction writers out there and then who have been out there since the eighties. The um, obviously that's just a tiny, 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 tiny fraction. So what I do when I talk about Sycamore Hill and I talk about, who gets invited and how many people we can have um, is I always say like, Hey, uh, start your own workshop, you know, let, uh, let other workshops bloom. Um, and there are other workshops um, out there right now. I mean, I think uh, the Rio Hondo workshop that Walter John Williams runs is about to begin. Um, and, you know, really the, the trick of it, the, the biggest trick is, yeah, is finding a place, finding an affordable place where you can house and feed writers for a week or for three days or however long, you know, there's also the long running uh, Turkey city workshop in Austin, Texas, which is uh, run with a slightly different model. Um, I've been to Turkey city one year. It's a, it's a great workshop. Um, but yeah, I just think like, yeah, m more workshops, more workshops for everybody in that way. Yeah. The more people can get invited to all these, all these workshops that we need to have. That's what I always tell people when they, they have a critique about my podcast that's sort of unfair or I wish you'd ask this and that. I'm like, launch your own podcast and go get that person on the show and, and yeah. talk to them. You know, you'll, yeah. you'll get something good out of it. Trust me. But what is, I would say, your experience overall with the workshop, both in terms of participating in and running it? What's it taught you about writing? Um, You know, and this might be obvious, I guess, especially if, if for a listener who's been in a, maybe an MFA program or who just is a writer themselves, but um, it, it bears repeating, which is that when you critique stories, um, I think you learn more critiquing other people's stories than hearing critiques of your own work. Um, because 
other people don't work the same way that you do. And so when you look at something they've brought, whether it's a manuscript that they think is practically done or whether it's a manuscript that they think has big problems that they want you to help them with, um, you know, taking apart, it's like taking apart of, you know, you're used to your domestic car, the way that you build your domestic car. <laughs> and suddenly you're, you have to work on a, a foreign car, right? And like, well, am, am I using, you know, imperial size tools or metric tools, <laughs> right? And, and so I think it's interesting to like, yeah, try to take apart another person's story using your own toolkit. Um, you, you just learn about the possibilities of fiction and you learn about um, different ways of doing things that, that I, you don't necessarily learn about when someone is just talking to you about your own story. Not to say that critique of your own story isn't valuable because of course that it is, it's very valuable too, because yeah, you get, in this case, uh, with a workshop like Sycamore Hill or Rio Hondo, you get maybe a dozen or so people's opinions on, um, what you've done or what you think you've done. And maybe they tell you that, um, you haven't done what you think you've done, or maybe they tell you something that you didn't know you were doing. And it turns out you were, um, you know, having, um, 12 people, uh, point out something that, you know, your unconscious mind was doing, it can be kind of a, maybe unsettling, but it's also a really interesting process. And yes, um, if you go around a circle and, you know, 12 or 13 people say very similar things. I think that's definitely time for you to sort of perk up and pay attention. And, um, yeah. and, you know, if you go around a circle and you get like, uh, 13 very distinct opinions that are all going off in all directions, I think that might be time we think like, Oh, I think I've, I've maybe I'm done here because this is a kind of story that, uh, like a lot of great art people can just pick up and, it becomes theirs and they do with it what they want to do. And often that's to me, that's the sign of, of, of great art. It's, it's a collaboration between the, the artist and the audience. That brings me to a, one of the other interesting threads I found in the, the, or I saw in the, the book from a couple of the stories, you've got characters who are art makers who find major success, but die young. And um, it, it occurs at least twice in the book. I, there, there may be a, another instance of it. I also found it interesting. The most obscure word you, you put in the book is a uh, kakorophobia, the, the abnormal fear of failure. So <laughs> not a question exactly, but, but it's a connection that I, I found kind of interesting in the, the, the course of the work. So, but yeah, that, that sense of, and it's something, I mean, I've been grappling with over 500 episodes of this, the relationship of artist to audience, that gestalt, and what what comes of it. I mean, it's it's the same question of do you find a sort of writing for the workshop tendency or or concern, you know, when, when it comes either to your own stories or or those of others that are are being sent in, or is it enough? Or are the writers, we'll just say, strong enough that they're not writing for this particular you know dozen people to make sure they're making an impression of some kind? Oh yeah, so yeah, I'll 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 tackle those backwards. So yeah, like no, yeah, I, don't I, think, I tend to do this. I'm sorry, but you know, oh, no. I, I throw four questions I, in one. So. I don't think anyone is is um, trying to sort of write for um, for I mean, the workshop. I don't I don't, yeah. I don't want to speak yeah. for every writer who's ever been, but I I don't think that's that that common. Um, you know, I think they've they've got their interests and what they want to do, and they're bringing it in. And yeah, I think sometimes maybe. Um, the folks at the workshop maybe aren't necessarily always their primary reading audience. And so it is uh, good for them to get a take on it, but I don't think anyone's writing. I think, I think um, lots of times, especially if you've never been before and you're, you know, you maybe don't feel as confident or you feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, then you know, you, you really want to bring something great because you really want to knock people's socks off, right? You really want, hmm. you want everyone to just yeah. stand up and applaud after they you know, critique your story, but, and, and that's a very human way to feel, right? I mean, that's very, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's also completely valid. And, um, I think I've done it and I, you know, great friends of mine have done it too, is to, is to bring something to a workshop where it, it's just broken and you don't know how to fix it. You know, you don't, you don't know what's something's wrong and you can't even locate the, the area that's, that's the problem. Um, so you want to get some other people's opinions. I think that's a, extremely valid and there's nothing wrong or shameful about that either. So that's about sort of writing you bring to the workshop. Um, talking about sort of artists and, and uh, success and failure, you know, I guess I do have um, 
uh, an allergy or a phobia or something, and, and it's probably wrongheaded, but I had it, um, about uh, writing about uh, artists. You know, I guess I've you know, sure. just read so much writing about writers, and I've read good writing where, about writers, and I've read maybe less than good writing about writers. And so I, I, I worry that, that I don't want to uh, commit a similar sin, let's say. So in both the stories that you mentioned, they, there are artists in them, but they're not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is the, are the friends of the artist. Right. And, um, so that's really interesting to me. Um, especially in the case, I mean, we can, we can talk about one of the stories if you want, you know, uh, horses blow up dog city, uh, which, um, is the story that, you know, I wrote in 1994, um, and it came out in 1996. Uh, it's on the one hand, it's goofy and absurd. I mean, it's, it's, it, what an absurd world where, you know, a puppeteer becomes like, you know, this global media sensation, right? I mean, that's just, that's just goofy on the face of it, but, but, and there's lots of other goofy stuff happening in that story, you know, with like sure, but, um, yeah. the extremely tall lute player who was based on a, you know, an actual friend of mine who's an extremely tall fellow who plays lutes and other stringed instruments. Um, and lots of other fun and Easter eggs are in there. But all that is sitting on top of this extreme, extreme sadness. Right. And, you know, the extreme, extreme sadness was that uh, um, in in. 1994, Kurt Cobain killed himself. And a lot of my friends, you know, a lot of friends in the music industry, a lot of my friends worked for, worked, uh, for him, let's put it that way. Um, hmm. And we were not all maybe the greatest at, uh, um, let's put it, our emotional intelligence scores might have not have been topping the charts, let's put it that way. And so I wanted sure. to write about people who um, maybe, uh, express their emotions in different ways than, than a lot of mainstream fiction would, would have it. People whose emotions were underneath the waves instead of above the waves. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was, that was what I was trying to get at with that story. Even though, yeah, at the heart of it, it's this extremely, it's this goofy story about a world where like a, a, a kooky puppeteer can become a media sensation. You know, as you bring it up, it's weird that it didn't occur to me, you know, in the process of reading it, but the relation of friendship and the characters who don't have friends in several of the, the stories, they are remarkably different tones for you. When characters have someone that they're reflected by versus the the ornithopter uh, stronghold, which are back to back, where, where characters are isolated and on their own. Those are very, very different tones in your, your story. I found the ornithopter to be the most haunting of, of the entire collection, weirdly, but um, probably because I haven't worked in an office in eight years now, and I'm really hoping never to go back. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's not just the return, but the return and the uh, seeing and being seen by, by the people who knew you when. Yeah. And again, not a question, but, <laughs> well, no, but, but that's very perceptive. And you know, it's, it's, I, I have never actually heard that before. And that's extremely perceptive about, yeah, the stories where there is not a, a friend or a group of friends. Um, they're, yeah, they're the stories that are, I wouldn't call them horror. Ellen Datlow would get mad at me if I called them horror, but, but, you know, they're, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're definitely the darker ones. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've thought about it that way before. So that's really interesting for me to think about. I mean, Do you yeah. stay in touch with friends, Do old friends? With, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I I stay in touch with friends. I mean, as uh, Emily Dickinson wrote in one of her letters, uh, "My friends are my estate." And the first time I read that, that just I was like, "Oh yeah, that rings true for me." I mean, many nice. many things are important in life. Um, uh, you know, primary romantic relationships can be important for people. Um, you know, success in your job can be important for people. Uh, to me, I would yeah say that like, if it's not the absolute most important thing, it's, it's always going to be on the top line is, is, uh, is friendship. Um, and, uh, and well, the characters see. struggle to stay in touch. Even the, the more up to date ones where there's social media and other ways of, of reaching out, they still struggle with it. 
in terms of, you know, the, the, the need for in-person seems significant in, in the stories. Yeah. That, that emails and Facebook is not, not enough to, to keep those connections alive, really. Yeah. I, I, mean, I say this I, is someone who dips into people's lives once a week and, and steps back out like this. So you know, it's a different sort of world. But. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a struggle for a lot of people who, uh, especially now, yeah, with the pandemic. Um, uh, on the one hand, we've seen the beauty of what a lot of online contact can do and all the zooms and all the slacks and, and, um, all the different ways to stay in touch. But, uh, you know, I think it's also just shown a lot of people what, what they are missing. I mean, I do know people, I know people who are like very happy now. It's like, Oh, I realize, you know, the pandemic made me realize that I am very good at being a hermit and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And I prefer it to being out uh, you know, going out in to the dance world. every week or yeah. whatever. But, uh, uh, but I think for many of us, you know, we realize like, oh yeah, just like that human contact in the real world, um, is, is something that a lot of us miss. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I apologize for not sitting down in person with you, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do remote this time. Next time you're in New York, we'll, uh, New York, New Jersey, we'll, we'll sit down for a real conversation, you know, face to face, but, Sounds you know. good. but this is pretty good. So how's Sycamore Hill changed over the years? And I assume you didn't have in person for the first couple of years of the pandemic, have you gone back to? Oh yeah, we just didn't. I mean, so 2020 and 2021, uh, we did not have the workshop because yeah, 2020, uh, was impossible. And then yeah. 2021, I think, um, the retreat center where we have it, uh, I forget what happened exactly. I think that was the scheduling just didn't work out. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, this year, obviously, things are much uh, safer with, thanks to vaccines and science. Um, we uh, and so, yeah, hopefully, I mean, we'll see, you know, it, every day is anything can happen day at this point. It, it, it always was. But now, especially it, it is. Oh, I'm, um, I'm hosting a pharmaceutical conference in mid-October for my, my day job. And I'm still in the, well, it's only four and a half weeks away. There's no time for a variant to show up <laughs> and wipe us out at this point. So right. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. We can actually meet in person and, and have a, you know, hybrid Zoom for people who can't make it. But yeah, I just try to, I try to build up my risk points. You know, I try to hoard my risk points and then spend them. Right. So this year I've been to, <laughs> I went to ICFA, the uh, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts in Florida. Um, and then I went to, um, I ran the Sycamore Hill workshop. I went on a trip to London and then I went on this trip to New York and, and New Jersey. And yeah, now I kind of think I'm done for the year. I've, I've spent all my risk points and now I need to start building them back up again. I think just going to Florida in and, in and of itself is, well, anyway, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll start editorializing if we uh, go there, you. but, but again, how's the, the workshop changed over, over the years? Oh, right. Uh, well, so here's one obvious way we can, we can look at it and see how it's changed that first year. And again, I wasn't involved at all. Um, was, uh, it was John and Mark were like, well, let's, let's get a bunch of our writer friends, most of, most of whom were in North Carolina at that time. And a, a couple other people from out of state, um, James Patrick Kelly, a great friend of John Kessel's. Uh, oh, sure. yeah. And it was all guys. And it was all white guys. Um, so, you know, the next year they, they ran it. They were like, aha, we, we, you know, we will, we will invite some people. We will like people from all over the country and we will have women. Um, so certainly like on all the various uh, axes of diversity, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, very slowly improved over the years. Um, so that, uh, I just want to have a mix of all kinds of people, um, at the workshop, uh, whether it's, you know, gender or race or background or, um, even, uh, the amount of time you spent in the genre. I think it's really interesting to have people who are, uh, veterans of decades of, of work, um, you know, interacting with people who are, you know, professionals, they're published professionals, but they may be at earlier points in their career um, and all points in between. So that's definitely um, uh, one way in which it's changed. Um, in a lot of ways, I mean, yeah, and, you know, obviously one of the things I write about is sort of like change and people who maybe aren't able to cope with change. So thinking about it in terms of the actual workshop, um, it, the... 
the, the workshop itself, the model, like I said, the Milford model, that really has not changed a lot. And I know in the greater world of people talking about um, uh, MFA programs and fiction workshops, there's a lot of talk about like, how do we, how do we change up the workshop model? How do we change up the critique model? How do we change up teaching um, fiction writing? But as far as the actual sitting in a circle and taking time um, and, and really kind of bearing down on the manuscripts, um, I don't think that's changed a whole lot um, over the years. I think maybe early on there were maybe if, uh, some controversial people who attended who uh, maybe acted out in a way that I don't think people act out anymore. Um, in the FNSF world? I find I that hard to believe. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Didn't I meet you at Harlan's party? Sorry, um, go, go uh, on. <laughs> I, I mean, the aforementioned gentleman uh, did attend one year. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so uh, it was not a year when I was in attendance. Um, uh, what? But yeah, the model itself holds up as long yeah. as it's, again, civil or, or everybody understands, you know, what they're there for? Yeah, everybody understands what they're there for. We're there to talk about the manuscript. We're not there to, to you know, judge the personality of, of the person who wrote it. And we're there to be professionals. But we're also, yeah, we are there to, like, bear down on it. I think, um, we, we, I mean, we're very serious about what we do at Sycamore Hill. And, and uh, for instance, uh, just this is kind of a, a minor point, but I think it's interesting. You know, we take, we probably take at least two hours to talk about every story and sometimes a lot longer. Um, and... I know there's other workshops where just because of time constraints, they don't, they don't talk as long. I mean, you can, it, when it, when it's your turn at, at the critique circle, um, at Sycamore Hill, you can talk for up to 10 minutes and then you get cut off. And then once we're all done going around the circle and the authors had a chance to say what they would like to say, uh, you know, quite often then, uh, the freeform discussion starts up and that can be, that can go on for a very long time and really interesting topics can come up that have that, don't just have to do with a specific story under discussion, but just with greater issues about um, what does it mean to do X, Y, or Z in the genre? What does it mean to, um, if uh, uh, we take a real historical event and add magic to it, is that okay? Is that not okay? What do we think about that? So lots of really interesting discussions can, can erupt um, just based on what's come up in the circle about a particular story. And as far as your engineering background, learning about group dynamics and how to make sure how to make sure the balance is working. I guess it's more chemistry than engineering, but um, what's it taught you? I guess about you know how to work with a group and how to identify you know the variables or the factors in the group. Oh, that's a great question too. I mean, I do you know the 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 veterans who um, attend. Uh, more frequently, uh, obviously, are known quantities, and uh, there are people. You know, people who come for the first time. Maybe I don't know as much about them. I try to. I try to gather a little intel to make sure that we're all going to get along okay. I guess but, you know another thing I say a lot of the time is I want. I don't mind pointful conflict, but I'm really hate pointless conflict. Um, yeah. So uh, it's good to have a range of opinions around the table. Um, sometimes. I think it can be wrongheaded to try to get, uh, you know, as we can see from our current media landscape, you know, this, there's a wrongheaded idea of both sides and things like that. But I definitely want a range of opinions around the table. I just want a range of opinions where, uh, yeah, something positive and, and um, worthwhile is being generated from our discussion and not just sort of pointless people um, yelling at each other. Right. We get enough of that in the day-to-day -day world. Yeah. So. So you mentioned stories that, that weren't included in the, in the adventurists. Um, beyond that, everything in the the book is thirty pages and under. You um, you got long form or or novel hopes and aspirations, or are you a, a short story devotee? Well, I, I mean, I think as far as like yeah, the link that's in the adventurists is just like that's what comes out when I sit when I sit down with. Um, sticking together uh, some some proto ideas maybe hoping a story comes out that's typically the link that comes out um i would like to, actually the link i would like to explore i think maybe for the uh, book the next if that happens is um maybe novella i think that would be really interesting to try to to try to work at that length because i i never really have i do like a lot of people i have um i have probably it, 
you know, at least a couple uh, novel-ish manuscripts-ish uh, in, in the can that I don't think are ever going to see the light of day and probably don't need to see the light of day. So, I, you know, I've definitely tried my hand at it. Um, it's been a while. Uh, it just didn't, uh, they just still felt like juvenilia that I don't need to, to show the world. Um, I do, I mean, I, I have like a milieu that I would love to write a novel about someday, but it just, it feels like one of those that I have to do so much research and so much reading. And I don't know when I'm going to find the time to do all that, that research and reading to, um, to really work on it. Yeah. What's the, um, I just say, what's the writing practice like? You know, what's the, the balance with day job? I don't know about family situation for you, but you know, when and how do you write? Uh, well, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> That's way too you, sensitive a question. <laughs> you tell me, um, yeah. you know, I can tell uh, you how I don't write. That's, that's, that's real easy. So, I mean, but anyway. honestly, you know, one of the, one of the benefits for me having Sycamore Hill is that what it means is, and, and my friends will joke with me about this. It's like, yeah, no matter what, you know, you got to write that story every year for Sycamore Hill. Um, it's funny. Uh, it's it's like this collection was a replacement. Like, oh shit, there's a pandemic. There's no Sycamore Hill. I better finish these stories so we can put out the adventurous yeah, instead. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's some truth to that. I think there are yeah. a few in the collection that that did not go through uh, Sycamore Hill. But but True. yeah, no, that's definitely like a big uh, a big motivator for me. Um, I think. I mean, I've well, the the advice I give when people ask about you know writing. You know, the number one advice I would give is try everything and, you know, try. And, and as far as sort of writing strategies, you know, try every strategy do, you know, uh, you know, do the, you know, write a novel in November and do the right X number of words a day and do the right whenever you feel like it and just see what works for you, because that's what matters is what works for you. Um, and maybe I haven't found exactly what works for me. I don't know. Uh, but Typically, yeah, like I, um, I work a lot better, I think, with just sort of letting the ideas uh, uh, grow in the back of my mind or possibly fester in the back of my mind and then um, blasting stuff out pretty quickly and then revising it a, a few times. Um, that just seems to be the process that actually gets things on the page. And that is a very different process from the people who are, you know, 500 words a day or, or X number of sure. pages a day. Sure. Yeah. I'd wondered with the, with the engineering background, if that sort of bled into the writing as planning or, you know, whether it, it's completely divorced as far as those sorts of uh, mindsets go. Oh, I love, I, mean, I love, Oh, I love a checklist. Boy, I just could not tell you how much I love a checklist. <laughs> I love lists and checklists and patterns and programs and guidelines and all, all that stuff. I love it. But yeah, I think that uh, at some point it doesn't, all that part of my brain doesn't connect with the like, oh, okay, uh, you know, we're going to write a story about a, a talking tree and the Greenway system, uh, you know, like yeah. I, I don't think I can fit that into sort of write this number of words a day uh, or at this write at 530 every day kind of program mm -hmm. the way you can maybe do that with like a, I don't know, exercise program or something. Yeah. Which I have to skip today. Unfortunately, I'm supposed to do this afternoon, but I've discovered a friend's got an art exhibition opening and I have to oh. drive down to, to go see that. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll put off the yoga for one day. I, sure. I surely won't lose momentum, but you know, We'll see. Uh, tell me about the other, I'll say, creative outlets of yours. Uh, in, in the bio for The Adventurous, it mentions you writing and, and performing with some uh, some theater groups. Right. What's that entail? Oh, uh, well, I guess, you know, the, the, the overall uh, thesis here, I guess, is that I just couldn't commit to any, any one uh, art form. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of people, I was a theater kid. Uh, I was very lucky in that the uh, high school that I attended um, was uh, had an auditorium associated with it. It was built with Reynolds tobacco uh, money and it was a v extremely nice uh, 19 early 1920s uh, 2000 seat auditorium with just a you know completely professional setup and I was you know like on the tech crew there and got to skip class and go you know, uh, run sound and pull flies up and down and things like that. And, uh, 
yeah, it's you know it's, that's that's a line in the bio, right? It's like Harry Houdini played that theater, so you know, <laughs> which is my I, last question, but yeah. you jumped ahead. <laughs> yeah, we we've been through the same trap door because it was the one trap door in the stage of that theater. Um, but yeah, uh, and then I, I, I guess a lot of times I'm I'm always sort of trying to like decide like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna buckle down on uh, writing so I've got to quit doing theater. I'm gonna buckle down on music so I've got to quit. Uh, doing writing and so yeah but theater is definitely something that's just sort of always bobbed to the surface and so i went off yeah i went to engineering school but i still did a few um i still worked either tech or even acted a little bit on some productions in college and then um got away from it for a while but i would every now and then i would i would get back involved and then yeah i um met some folks at a renaissance fair no less who, who kind of got me pulled into their Shakespeare troupe and got me up on stage in a way that I hadn't really hadn't been in, at all ever before. And so, yeah, I did Shakespeare for a few years. I had a lot of fun with that. I got involved with a more um, kind of avant-garde, let's say, for lack of a better word, um, local theater group, doing all kinds of productions, both writing for them and, and performing with them. And as with so many of these local uh, independent groups, um, it kind of spun apart for a variety of sorted reasons um but it's something that i still enjoy it's it's a great contrast you know w when you're writing it's it's just you and that blank screen or that blank page or whatever you're whatever you're writing on and that's it and with uh theater of course it's a group effort and it's uh working with a community in different ways and often especially these days in theater when you're not just working from a, a written play you're, you're devising a performance of your own then even the actual you know the actual working on the text process is a is a communal process so it's great to have that contrast and it's a it's a it's very different and something I, I enjoy a lot um and maybe if I find the right people to work with again uh around here I'll, I'll get back into it right now I'm kind of on a bit of a hiatus from um performing in in theater mm -hmm. and I'm sure the pandemic also extend something like that, or at least, you know, curtail some of the, the, the opportunities. Right. Right. Yeah. A lot of people went online and, and had varying degrees of success. There were some really, there were some extremely cool online uh, shows during the pandemic. And then there were, yeah, there were just some people who yeah. were just trying to get by until they could get back on a real stage. Right. So who are you reading? Uh, Which I know yeah. I should have told you was coming because yeah. everybody hates drawing a blank on that one. But <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm reading right now, and I'm I'm just about done, and I've really enjoyed it. It's a very short book, uh, but it's Piranesi. Um, um, so, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Is it Susanna Clark? Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, the yeah. Uh, the author. I, yeah, right. Yeah, there um, it is. I, the one upside about doing these remotely is that I can look up stuff online <laughs> while we're talking. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Susanna Clark. Yeah, um, I've I've really enjoyed uh, Piranesi quite a bit. Um, just such a great like, yeah. it's just delightful. And I, you know, I I don't uh, like I said I'm close to the end, so a lot of the mysteries are are have been revealed. But it's just great to read a book where you genuinely don't know where it's going. I hadn't been spoiled and i'm making air quotes when i say that uh word but you know i hadn't been spoiled as to as to the setup and um, it was just really delightful to not know what was happening and to have all the sort of possibilities and then so often um you know that's a problem both with the mystery genre itself and just with any with the whole idea of mystery and fiction right is that the mysteries are always more interesting and fascinating than than um the solutions or the revelations, but I think in this book, I'm actually really enjoying the revelation as well. So, uh, um, I'm really digging that. Um, and other stuff you've read in recent months that oh, you've just plotted over. Yeah. Goodness. Well, I mean, so here's the thing. I am lucky that a lot of my favorite writers on the planet are also friends of mine. Right. <laughs> and so it inevitably, it's going to sound sort of, you know, crony ish or something. If I, if I mention it, but it's, it's literally who I've been reading lately. Um, I know what's great is the ones you don't mention who are going to get pissed off, but go <laughs> right, ahead. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so yeah, I mean, some of my, like, I think I, I don't have my reading list right here at hand, but I think the most recent books I've read are by three of my closest friends who are, who are great friends and great writers. And that would be, um, uh, the first would be the dark ride. It's John Kessel's latest collection of stories. Um, from Subterranean Press, uh, it collects uh, a 
I think everything from like the early, well, it doesn't collect everything, but it, it collects stories from as early as like the early eighties to the present. Um, and just some really great stories and a really great overview of his career in short fiction. Um, there are just some stories where he is, his, he's bearing down on, uh, you know, the, the dilemma of existence, but also there's some really moving emotional stories too. I love his story, Buffalo. It's a story that I would recommend to anyone out there. It's just a devastatingly great story. Um, my, my extremely close, uh, best friend, uh, Christopher Rowe just had a novella come out from, uh, tour.com, uh, these prisoning Hills. Um, it's a continuation of his, Kind of, I guess you call it, might call it, you might call it post cyberpunk, um, extremely strange, uh, alternate future uh, Kentucky and Tennessee stories. Um, it's a great. It's a genre. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> it is, I mean, it is. He's and he's the king yeah. of it. Um, and then, uh, uh, like recently, I read Karen 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 Fowler Karen Joy Fowler's latest book, Booth, uh, the novel about uh, the Booth family. Um, I really like that and just her amazing ability to capture uh, history and sort of the hidden corners of history or the things you don't think about necessarily in, in, in history on the page. So those are the first three that, that come to mind. And like I said, yeah, they're close friends. So, you know, all disclaimers, all all conflict of interest disclaimers on this, but I think they're great <laughs> writers and I'm just I'm lucky and privileged to count them as friends. Do you feel like a peer now that there's a, now that the adventurist is in print, do you, do you um, feel like you actually like belong, belong, or was did you already feel it just from the short stories, or have you never felt it because, like me, you're a neurotic wreck? Well, I hope it's not the know, latter. So. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll cop to being a neurotic wreck. Why not? You know, okay. Um, <laughs> it's self-effacement uh, is fine. <laughs> it's not uncommon, right? I mean, that's why that's why they have the phrase imposter syndrome is because a lot of a lot of creative people struggle with that, uh, and they struggle with that whether they are at the beginning of their careers or whether they have, you know, uh, have, you know, tons and tons of output. Um, and frankly, I like those people a lot better than the pompous egotists, egotists, right? I mean, yeah. if, if you had to pick, if I had to pick of who I wanted to be in the room with, I'd be in the room with the neurotic Rex instead of the pompous egotists. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, no, it's great. It, it's, it's great to have, a uh, uh, a book length, object that I can point to on the shelf or that I can walk into the bookstore and look over. And it's like, Oh, Hey, they, they're stocking my book here. That's a great feeling. And, yeah. um, I, yeah, I treasure that. Um, it's wonderful. And, you know, let's hope that there's, uh, another one and another one beyond that and, and so on. Yeah. No, keep my fingers crossed. Now, the very last question is the other major recurring motif in your book. We've, we've gone through a couple of them already, and I'm hoping this one is not something that, you know, casts doubt, uh, self-doubt on you or, or anything weird like that. But the number of characters who bang their knees at various <laughs> points, <laughs> is, is that a thing for you? <laughs> You were talking to a person who has extremely bad knees. Yeah, no. I had to it's, assume the number of characters who get wiped out because of a knee injury. I was it, like, this this has to be a thing for him. Yeah, no, it's it's like of all the various, you know, things that go wrong with human bodies. I think I was about, I don't know, I think I was maybe like 30-ish or something. And I just suddenly had this like knee go out on me on a beach trip. And, and you know, I've, I've uh, had hassled with it ever since but um so so it is kind of my go-to injury and and yeah. no I, I and i know that now and it, and it kind of amuses me so no you're not you're not the person telling me this for the first time but it is really funny in that when we were sequencing the stories in the collection <laughs> you know um and i was working with with gavin and kelly about this i had a you know i think they had a spreadsheet but i had, I had made my own spreadsheet and i was like okay well you know, here are the time travel stories and, you know, here, here are some different themes and I'm going to sort them. So that it's not just, they're not all like stuck together. In yeah, the same a, a series of, yeah. What, what yeah. do I want to put first? What, what, what do I want to put last? All that kind of thing. And I definitely, I had a column in the spreadsheet that was like knee injury and story <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want to just have all the knee injuries clotted together in the same place in the book. So, you know, next Thank time, you. next time we're going to move to a different joint uh, that, that can fail as, as well, someone like, ages. Like me, you're in your 50s. So I'm going to say the hip 
uh, the, the, the hip is where, where things are going yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> something yeah, to watch out for. Good. It's good that you're doing yoga. I do. I, I need to do more yoga. The, the, the pandemic was great for me, frankly, as far as fitness goes. Um, yeah. A lot of performers, a lot, a, a lot of, uh, I'm really into a, this thing called immersive theater. And, and I am friends with, and I follow a lot of immersive theater performers who are often uh, dancers and body workers and stuff. And they were all out of work. And so they all went online and started doing like yoga classes online and Pilates mm -hmm. classes online and all these kind of different classes online. And so I was in great shape because I was just doing all these classes. And, uh, and now they've all gone back to the real world of performance. And I, I need to get back doing the yoga just on my own. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm with you. I, I got in the best shape of my life uh, over the span of 2020 to, to 22. So, uh, you know, I combined that with a number of injuries that, that knocked me out for a while. But, you know, I'm, I'm still doing my best uh, or living my best pandemic life, I guess. Yeah. So, Good. you know, we try. But Richard, thanks so much for coming on the show. And like I say, I'll, I'll go order my copy of The Adventurists after this. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to um, future books and future conversations with you. Great. Thanks so much, Gil. And that was Richard Butner. His new collection, The Adventurists and Other Stories, is absolutely wonderful. Go get that from Small Beer Press and, and keep up with Richard's work through his site, richardbutner.com. That's R-I-C-H-A-R-D-B-U-T-N-E-R. Dot com. He's also on Twitter as Buttonerian and on Instagram as Our Butner. I'll have links to all that in the, the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by telling other people about it. Tell them about this podcast. Comes out every week. Neat conversations with all sorts of creative folks. You can also help it out by telling me what you like and don't like about the podcast, who you think I should record with, what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should check out and turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me a postcard. I love postcards, a letter, email, uh, or by leaving a message on my Google voice number which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And uh, messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go super long and get cut off, call back in and, and leave a second message. Um, also, let me know if it would be okay to use your message in an upcoming episode of the podcast. Uh, you might say something that would be really neat for the audience to hear, but I would never do that without the uh, speaker's approval. So let me know. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, I've got the Patreon, I got the PayPal, but my finances are just fine. The expenses for the podcast are pretty low. So if you've got money, really, you know, help individuals, help institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, Crowdfunder, etc. Some people need help with medical bills or rent or getting an artistic project off the ground, and you can make a difference there. If you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or, or foundations, I give to my local food bank, uh, the Poor People's Campaign. I make targeted election contributions. Um, but there are other things you can do. Freedom funds, election funds, uh, Planned Parenthood and Women's Choice and abortion funds. There are all sorts of things you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, 
talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up The Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to The Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 